Biomechanics of Fractures and Fixation. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series, Version 5. Slides are by Dr. Michael Kane, and I'm Saqib Rahman narrating. So the lecture here is going to cover uh, several things. Here's an overview. Uh, we're going to go over basic biomechanics, uh, biomechanics of fractures, bone healing, fixation strategies, and constructs. So fracture fixation is a balance of biology and mechanics, right? There's a race between bone healing and construct failure. That is, um, no implant is going to be able to hold an ununited fracture forever, and eventually the uh, implant will fail if the bone doesn't heal in time. Um, so we want to promote bone healing while considering the mechanical stability and dura uh, durability of your fixation construct. For example, cast, you know, if you put on a plaster cast, that's less stable than an LCDCP plate, right? Uh, but it doesn't disrupt the normal bone healing biology, right? So this is sort of an extreme example. Um, so there is sort of this paradox of internal fixation where, you know, the more invasive you get to provide stability, uh, the more you can impact the normal bone healing. So, you know, there's sort of this balance between, you know, carpentry and just getting in there and fixing everything like a puzzle piece with maximal stability um, versus gardening, where you're trying to nurture something to be able to grow and heal. Um, so you need to be able to create enough rigidity to allow for function uh, in following AO principles yet have enough flexibility in a normal biologic environment to allow for and promote bone to return to its normal biomechanical state. So let's go through some basic biomechanics. We're gonna go through a lot of definitions here. Um, so the mechanical competence of bone relies on material properties, structural properties, and if you think about material properties, there's really no consideration to geometry, right? It's independent of shape, We'll go through this a little bit. Uh, structural properties do consider geometry uh, and material, and it's dependent on shape and material. And these are things like you know, bending stiffness, torsional axial stiffness, etc. So, if you think about material properties and stiffness, uh, let's say, um, so um, stress is force over area. Strain is like the change in length over the original length or change in height or original height. Uh, elasticity is measured by Young's modulus or E modulus. Um, and uh, strain is presented without units. So it's just, again, the change in height over height. Um, and uh, stress is measured as gigapascals. And we'll show some examples of this, and here's an example of a stress strain curve, and um, how you can then determine uh, elastic modulus, which is the slope, right? So, if you have a higher slope, that means it's a higher elastic modulus, and if you have a lower slope, that's going to be lower on that curve. So, this is something we'll also talk about uh, in some of the other lectures. We talk about Perrin strain theory of fracture healing, but um, strain uh, in this example uh, being shown as compressive strength is um, that change in height over the original height. Let's go through some material property definitions. So elastic modulus is the elasticity of the material, meaning how elastic is it where complete reversal of deformation is still possible. The yield strength is a point where permanent elastic deformation occurs uh, and it doesn't bounce back to where it was. And then ultimate strength is the point where the material catastrophically fails. So the term ductile describes a material with a lot of elasticity and the ability to deform, whereas brittle is a material with a small amount of elasticity and very little ability to deform. Uh, fatigue failure occurs from repetitive loading below the ultimate strength limit and you get uh, micro fractures. And then the fatigue limit is the maximal load uh, that will not cause a microfracture. So these are some terms we'll talk about when you are discussing materials. So what about elastic modulus? So many different materials have different 
elasticity or modulus of elasticity represented as Young's modulus in gigapascals. And here are some examples. Uh, you know, ligaments, bone cement, cortical bone, and then different metal type of implants. You can see that titanium has a more elastic um, property than stainless steel, for example. And then here are other, some of the other um, uh, characteristics that we talked about, like yield strength. And um, here are uh, the elastic modulus of um, uh, multiple different materials and their yield strength, ultimate strength, and failure strain. So other properties include um, anis so anisotropy, right? So something's anisotropic means uh, it's direction-dependent mechanical properties of a material. So bone is a transversely anisotropic material. Um, isotropic means something where there's no change in properties regardless of load direction. Um, so stainless steel and titanium are isotropic. Um, viscoelastic is time-dependent deformation and stiffness increases with faster loading. So this is another term you'll hear used a lot. Uh, and then if you have gradual deformation over time, that's called creep. So here's examples of um, anisotropy versus viscoelasticity. So anisotropy shown on the, on the left, so stiffness is uh, it depends on the loading direction, and you can see stress-strain curves depending on the direction that you um, load bone, uh, and you can see that there's you know, higher elasticity uh, when you load it longitudinally and lower elasticity when it's loaded transversely. Uh, viscoelasticity, so the stiffness is dependent on the loading rate, so you can see if you load very, very quickly, um, you have more stiffness or you know, higher modulus of elasticity. And if you load very, very slowly, um, you have, you're much lower on the stress-strain curve and you have more elastic uh, material or elastic response. So what about structural properties? Well, um, these are... Um, you know, if you think about the shape and size of the object, uh, in fracture management, when we think about structural properties, you have the bone, you have the fixation device, um, bending stiffness of the plate um, is something to consider, as well as bending of like a K wire, for example. And you know, uh, cylindrical objects increase the bending stiffness increases by the fourth power. So, for instance, if you take a K wire and double its size, it's going to uh, have a sixteen fold increase in bending stiffness. So when you're thinking about plates, you think about width, thickness, and length of the plate. When you think about wires, you think about diameter. Is it solid versus cannulated? Uh, nails are hollow, um, so they're lighter, but because of that, um, um, because of strength to the, you know, being dependent on the fourth power of the radius, they maintain their strength, so they're very ideal for weight bearing. So um, this demonstrates the influence of cross-sectional geometry on bending stiffness for different implant, um, basic implant shapes. So you know, if you can understand the weak point of the implant you're using, um, uh, then you can realize how to make it stronger. For example, pins and nails get stronger with bending by increasing the diameter, right? And plates get stronger by increased width. So um, that's what's shown here. Um, how is load transferred? Well, there are different ways to think about it. One is vectors, force and direction. Uh, another way is rotational moments created by the force and distance. Uh, and lever arms, if you think about like a uh, seesaw, for example. Uh, and here is an example of distal radius, uh, an ulnar styloid fracture. And you can imagine this um, trauma occurring from this vector with this force and direction. Um, so rotational moments are influenced by the forces and distance of those forces, uh, understanding the relationship between the rotational forces and the length increases. That is, uh, is there a lot of torsional force on the femur and hence you know, longer, stronger implants needed to stabilize the huge rotational forces that occur in the femur? Um, so these are forces we also have to uh, consider. 
Um, understanding lever arms uh, uh, is important as well. So a longer plate disperse, uh, disperses the force um, over a greater area. Um, we'll show this in the next slide, which is why you can use a long plate with one screw close to the fracture and one screw very far away from the fracture. Um, and short segments are going to experience uh, higher forces. So this is try, you know, we're trying to demonstrate that here. Uh, and you can also see that here. So these are some examples of lever arms um, where um, you have a seesaw example. You have sort of example of an arm here. And if you think about it, um, in order to, um, you know, if you have Frank's, let's look, let's look at our plate example here. Uh, if you apply a bending force uh, at this level here, um, if you have fixation that ends here, uh, you're going to see a lot of uh, force um, and a, a stress riser essentially at the end of that plate there, uh, as opposed to if you were to increase the lever arm all the way up to where your bending force is occurring, you can distribute that much better and you have a much smaller stress riser. So that's an example of how we can utilize um, lever arms when we're thinking about constructs. And we'll come back to this uh, a little bit later in the other portions of this um, video. So we're actually going to pause here and then we'll pick up in the next video on biomechanics of fractures.